Um, thanks, David. Um, I took the opportunity actually to broaden out what I want to say today and talk not just about um, acidification, but really about the carbon problem generally um, for the oceans, because it's not just acidification that's the, uh, that's the issue. So um, we know, of course, that we're pumping a whole heap of CO2 into the atmosphere. Um, and we know so much about climate change, in fact, that our head of CSIRO in Australia says we don't need to study it anymore because we know, we know it's happening and, and what's causing it. Um, and the little figure down the bottom from Cape Grim, um, CSIRO's uh, figures showing uh, parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere uh, climbing at a precipitous uh, rate in recent history. Then there are then, of course, flow-on impacts on the oceans as about 30% um, of the carbon that we emit from human activities is drawn down into the oceans, and that's doing all kinds of things. So um, climate change is changing the temperature of the oceans. It's um, expanding it um, through thermal expansion, causing sea level rise. Um, temperature is changing. Uh, temperature and winds and a whole heap of other factors uh, driving circulation changes. And then the chemistry is changing um, quite significantly. And there are various um, variables we can look at in the chemical changes to the, uh, to the oceans. The ones that are garnering the most interest uh, include ocean acidification, um, salinity, uh, and also increasingly hypercapnia. And I'll have something about, to say about that in a moment. But first of all, ocean acidification. This is really rising up the list of visible policy problems. It's something that was mentioned in a fair bit of detail in the latest assessment report of the IPCC in 2013, AR5. So finally, it seems to be on the, the radar a bit. And uh, we've got a reasonable grasp of um, how the problem is playing out. Huge amounts of regional variability and also very complex process um, physiologically in terms of what it's doing to different um, ecosystems and species. Um, one way into looking at the problem is the, the way that Hugh Goldberg, of Hugh Goldberg and others uh, have done uh, in their well-known piece in Science in 2007, where they looked at the impact of um, CO2 uh, increases in CO2 concentrations in the oceans and what that means then for declining availability of carbonate ions for um, calcium carbonate forming structures like coral reefs and they um, projected forward looking at if we get rising atmospheric CO2 content what that means for reef communities um, and we see that with declining pH and de declining carbonate ions we're going to have uh, coral reefs that will not be dominated by coral reef communities uh, within our lifetime. Um, a more recent um, CO2 problem uh, that's been identified um, is the issue of ocean hypercapnia. Um, there's a great paper out a couple of weeks ago by Ben McNeil and Tristan Sass uh, in Nature. Um, and hypercapnia refers to the partial pressure of CO2 in the water column. Um, it makes up, I think, something like 0.5% of, um, uh, of the volume of, of dissolved um, carbon in, in the oceans. Most of it's caught up in carbonate um, and bicarbonate. And what McNeil and Sass have done is uh, look at some um, futures in terms of atmospheric CO2 concentrations and then looked at what that means for the oceans. And they found pretty starting, startlingly um, uh, and this is through a modelling process, and I'll take you through each of the charts. But uh, in the, um, up the top here, um, they're looking forward to seeing where you'll have hypercapnia in the world's oceans uh, towards the end of the century. And the, uh, the dark red and um, orange indicates these enormous hot spots where you'll, you'll have relatively large um, uh, concentrations of CO2. And these happen to be in very productive fisheries. And not only will you have large areas, so large spatial extent, but you'll also have significant duration over a number of months, up to 10 months per year, will be uh, in hypercapnia uh, conditions. And um, if you're a fisheries manager in the, um, in the Pacific and you're worried about tuna and um, all kinds of other species there, this is something that you're going to have to start worrying about uh, uh, because the physiological and ecosystem impacts 
of this problem are well known. So we know um, we are beginning to uh, know more about the carbon puzzle problem for the oceans, uh, but we are now only at the very formative stage in terms of policy and legal responses. Um, one way I think that um, is helpful to look at the um, carbon problem generally, but including for the oceans, is uh, to understand it as being a, a, a signature or a signal impact of the Anthropocene, the era that we're currently in, which is defined by the collapse of human and natural systems. Um, they've always been um, linked, but uh, they're now almost one and the same uh, across a number of different problem areas. Um, this diagram is I've adapted from a very helpful book that Gattuso and Hansen put out in 2011 on ocean acidification. And I think they identify really nicely the linkages between um, the atmosphere and climate problem, the oceans and organisms um, uh, connections in terms of both chemistry and biology, and then the linkages with society and economy uh, in terms of fisheries, tourism, ecological services, uh, and so on. So I think we now kind of know broadly the linkages um, and the problem, then what do we do in terms of governance of it? Well, um, this is the governance picture as it stands for ocean carbonation, as I'm going to call it. So we have a, a global regime for the atmosphere, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, and now the Paris Agreement, which is, uh, will be open for signature, I think, on the 22nd of April this year. And the Paris Agreement sets these very important goals of keeping world average temperatures below 2 degrees, or ideally 1.5, and carbon net neutrality by the end of the century says basically nothing about oceans at all. Then we've got the global oceans regime set in the 1982 UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, and under that, a whole heap of sub-regimes dealing with marine pollution, fisheries, etc. Then we've got regional uh, regimes, uh, regional uh, emissions regimes, for instance, like the EU uh, emissions trading system. We've got regional oceans agreements, like the United Nations Environmental Program, Regional Seas uh, Program, and fisheries regimes like um, Camelar. Um, then we've got national regimes dealing with emissions caps and targets, and feeding into the Paris process with nationally determined contributions. Then under that, we've got um, adaptation policies, marine protected areas, fisheries management, threatened species listing and recovery plans and so on. And all of these, to some extent, can engage with the ocean carbon problem. And they're all serving, to some extent, two goals, mitigation goals and adaptation goals. And I think my assessment at the moment would be uh, mitigation is obviously necessary, but the current mix of policies and their ambition is insufficient. In terms of adaptation, um, it will be necessary because so much change is built into the system, but of course it can never be entirely sufficient because there are some hard limits to adaptation that we're going to come up against. Can I just throw you a bit more detail then for each of these regimes and how they engage or do not engage with the ocean carbon problem? So first of all, the Global Atmosphere Regime, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, agreed in 1992 following the Rio Earth Summit, um, it has this overarching goal to avoid dangerous climate change, and we now know what dangerous climate change is because it's been filled in by a political agreement in Paris and before that at Copenhagen. Um, it's, it sets an obligation on governments to protect the climate system. also has provisions dealing with the enhancement of ocean and other carbon sinks, but there's nothing in there on the ocean carbon problem that would solve it. In fact, quite to the contrary, when you see a provision like Article 4, which says governments should try and enhance the drawdown of carbon into, uh, into the oceans, well, that could actually be counterproductive to dealing with the acidification and hypercapnia problem. Then look forward to the Kyoto Protocol. The Kyoto Protocol, um, as we know, set pretty minimal uh, emission caps and reduction targets on governments. And it did so for a basket of greenhouse gases um, not only CO2, which is the main gas of interest in terms of the ocean carbon uh, problem. And then fast forward to today, we have the 2009 Copenhagen Accord, which 
very helpfully, I think, set the two degree guardrail and also the process of intended nationally determined contributions and finally the Paris Agreement with a harder guardrail enshrined in law, uh, nationally determined contributions, very similar to the Copenhagen process, a passing reference to oceans in the preamble, but there's no detail at all about the ocean carbon problem. So that's the um, atmosphere regime. What about the oceans regime? Um, that is dominated by the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, uh, to which pretty much every government has subscribed, um, except the United States. Uh, and the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea is on paper a terrific regime. It's got a broad definition of pollution, uh, quite good obligations to protect the marine environment and to pr prevent pollution from all sources. And one of the features of, of UNCLOS is that it's an umbrella convention that you can build in implementing agreements underneath it um, on a regional or sectoral basis over time. And some of, some of this has happened. We do have sectoral and regional regimes that have been built in under UNCLOS that have to some extent engaged with the ocean carbon problem, but to a minimal, mostly minimal extent. So just take you through a few of them. The Marine Pollution Convention um, under the International Maritime Organization, that sets the very ambitious objective of eliminating oil and other hazardous pollution of the marine environment from ships altogether, right? That, that's what it wants to do. It's actually very strict. And it's got some great obligations in there that have worked effectively in minimizing oil pollution in the marine environment very, very effectively. MARPOL has even now started adopting CO2 emission standards for vessels. So we may not have global CO2 emission standards for cars yet, but we now do for vessels, um, thanks to, to MARPOL. But that's really just tinkering around the edges. Um, uh, shipping emissions, I think it's something like 5% of global CO2 emissions at the moment, but it's you know, pretty small cheers. Another regime that's engaging with the CO2 problem is the London Dumping Pro Protocol, which bans dumping. It was an agreement reached back in the 70s to stop the Russians dumping nuclear waste in the Arctic, essentially. And it's since expanded to stopping dumping of pretty much everything, um, including even if you want to be buried at sea, you need to get a permit under the London Dumping Protocol. Um, it's engaging with the CO2 problem. It's permitting subsea CO2 sequestration, so long as it doesn't escape. It is banning water column CO2 sequestration, so it's really limiting fertilisation um, opportunities, and that's probably a good thing. Um, what about regional seas? There's um, increasing emphasis in some regional seas agreements, whether it's the Mediterranean, whether it's the Arctic, even to some extent the Southern Ocean, with the ocean CO2 um, problem. And then what about fisheries? Um, I'll just highlight a few things. There are some interesting things going on in fisheries regimes in engaging with ocean acidification. And an example that's close to home here is Camilla. Camilla back in 2009 adopted a very helpful resolution on climate change, which also mentioned acidification. Um, in 2011, there were detailed guidelines on the establishment of marine protected areas that factored in climate change. Now, fisheries regimes generally are not engaging all that well with um, climate change or acidification. And there's even been some suggestion that there's a bandwagon effect going on. Mark Axelrod, in a paper in 2011, pointed out that sometimes climate change is being used as an excuse to continue overfishing. And governments have uh, basically been saying, look over there, look at climate change, don't look at um, our overfishing problem. And I think perhaps... Um, building on a point Hugh Possingham made this morning, you know, there's lots of other pressures uh, on, on a range of environments, including uh, marine environments, and overfishing is at the moment the, the dominant um, force. Uh, cl climate change uh, signal is, of course, a, a problem, but um, it'll take longer to, to show. What about at the national level in terms of the governance framework? just single out Australia. Um, so far as I can tell, there is basically no engagement at all with ocean acidification or um, CO2 um, water questions uh, under Australia's national law or policy framework. Um, uh, it's uh, not mentioned under the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act as a key threatening process. Um, climate change is mentioned, but not ocean acidification. Um, so far as I can tell, um, I can't see any instances where species have been listed. 
uh, as threatened on account of threats from um, changing ocean chemistry, nor have any ecological communities changed, nor has the bioregional planning system brought in, um, factored in um, ocean acidification. I could be completely wrong, but this is my, my researchers have thrown up none of it. Um, marine protected areas likewise haven't really been taking into account acidity. Climate change, sure, but, but not acidity or acidification. And likewise, strategic fisheries assessments don't seem to have factored this in. So there's a big, big gap. And basically, we can explain this um, by uh, um, really realising that there's a heap of regime deference going on. So the global atmospheric regime, the climate change regime, the UNFCCC in Paris, is being looked to as the constitution of the atmosphere and of the carbon cycle, even though it is ex so exclusively atmospherically focused and not on the oceans at all. And all these sub-regimes or connected regimes, whether it's a global oceans regime or regional oceans and atmosphere regimes and national regimes uh, are really deferring to the global regime, saying we can't deal with it, that has to be a global response. And just to give you an example of that, Climate change is listed as a key threatening process under the EPBC Act, um, but no threat abatement plan has been adopted, and the reasons given for there not being a threat abatement plan is because it's not a problem Australia can solve at all, so we've just got to, got to leave it to the UNFCCC. So it's kind of head in the sand approach. So just to kind of finish up, um, we are in a scenario where we've got these interesting international law regimes, the climate and oceans regimes, which um, have been described in the literature as complex adaptive systems, right? So there's, there's lots of um, system dynamics going on. Um, they're becoming kind of organic and self-sustaining, but they're very slow, they are undirected, they are reactive, and they've got um, high um, uh, propensity towards path dependency. So getting ocean acidification, for instance, into the Paris Agreement seemed to be completely impossible. Um, I was speaking to a couple of negotiators who said to me, look, we've got trouble enough getting just temperature in, um, let alone um, ocean acidification, so we can't bite off more than we can chew. Um, so we've got this path dependency problem. We've also got the regime deference problem. So we've got a whole heap of regimes that are just deferring to the global climate regime to solve both the atmosphere problem and the oceans problem, and that's just not working. So then at a lower scale, you've got an, the increased deployment of complementary management decisions by managers at regional and national levels to try and factor in the ocean carbon problem. And that's through things like reduced fishing pressure, new and expanded MPAs, um, potentially a new implementing agreement under UNCLOS on biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. Uh, and I guess I'd, I kind of want to leave you with this. Um, in my view, I think there's potential for some more um, creative destruction uh, to happen. Uh, we ought to see, and perhaps some governments want to encourage some regime dissonance, conflicts and, di and disruption. So you see sometimes examples where uh, a state or a group of states will just do something uh, unilaterally uh, in conflict with the global rules, like the EU has adopted for a time um, unilateral aviation emissions rules, um, and that really had the impact of spurring global action. Um, the big question over this is, would that undermine the global regime and undercut global efforts, or would it prompt a more effective global response? Uh, Raus Diana and Victor, in looking at um, regime complexes, characterise this as strategic inconsistency. And also, we might say there's a potential role for soft law to initiate change, uh, in large part because there's lower political cost. And so just perhaps graphically putting this, David, and then you'll let me, uh, then I will step down. Um, <clears throat> I think if we're kind of looking directionally towards a solution to the problem, uh, the UNFCCC and the Paris Agreement is part of the solution, but a small part. Um, there's other things that could happen on a regional basis. Uh, regional groupings of states might agree on a hydrocarbon moratorium. Um, we've already got one of those under the Antarctic Treaty System, given the banning on mining um, uh, above 60 degrees south. 
Um, you could think about national oceans laws and policies, and you might want to build those into your nationally determined contributions. You might actually want to mention ocean acidification in them. And then in the red, you might want to see some strategic inconsistency, but pushing in the right direction. You might want to see some states and groups of states getting uh, a bit more um, a bit more bolshy, to use an Australian word, a bit more um, uh, proactive in putting things on the agenda. Uh, I had an interesting conversation over lunch as to how that can, can happen within, a, uh, within the context of the Canadian Oceans and Fisheries um, Department. So you might get regional seas and RFMOs actually saying we, we want to aim towards a certain temperature or pH goal uh, or partial pressure CO2 goal. And finally, we might start to see some interesting developments under the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, perhaps even litigation as governments um, start, to, uh, start to try and take action by themselves. Thanks. Thank you.